For years, scientists have been struggling to explain bizarre sounds, some repeating, some heard only once, that come from the dark depths of the ocean. From bewildering hums to worrying bloops, the water transmits outlandish acoustic phenomena. One of these mysterious noises got named the upsweep. For the first time, this long train of sounds was registered in 1991 in the Pacific Ocean. One of the most unusual things about this signal is that it keeps changing, as if trying to confuse researchers even more. Like some unearthly howl, it varies from high to low frequencies and then back again. And you can hear it better in the spring and fall than in the winter and summer. Why the upsweep? It's simple. The sound travels from the bottom of the ocean towards its surface, as if sweeping up. Scientists do have a theory explaining this phenomenon. The activity of undersea volcanoes. Hot lava pouring into ice-cold ocean water could theoretically create such noises, but there's no proof found yet. Plus, the sound has been declining since 1991, even though it can still be detected. The bloop is the name given to an ultra-low frequency and incredibly powerful underwater sound that was recorded in 1997 by the U.S. National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. The bloop continued for approximately one minute. Having started from a low rumble, it gradually rose in frequency. It also kind of mimicked the noise created by marine animals, but its volume was so great that no living creature known to science could have made it. When the bloop occurred, underwater microphones managed to record it from a distance of 3,000 miles away. Rumor has it that the noise might have something to do with the fictional half-octopus monster Cthulhu or some other colossal deep-water creature. But if you don't believe in monsters, science has another explanation. Iceberg fracturing. The thing is that ice quakes recorded in the Scotia Sea resemble the mysterious bloop a bit too much for it to be a coincidence. The whistle resembles this annoying sound when a kettle of boiling water is telling you it's time to make a cup of tea. But even though it may not be as blood-curdling as some other bizarre ocean sounds, it doesn't make it any less mysterious. Plus, the whistle is very elusive. In 1997, only one underwater microphone was able to pick it up, and therefore, researchers didn't manage to pinpoint the source of the noise. The most likely cause of the sound is an eruption of one of the submarine volcanoes. Have you ever heard of Julia? No, not your neighbor. I'm talking about this otherworldly sound. Listen to it. It was recorded in 1999 by the U.S. National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. The source of the sound was most likely a large iceberg that ran aground somewhere in Antarctica. The sound was so loud that it was heard over a huge territory, and its duration was about 2 minutes and 43 seconds. Slow down. That's the name given to a sound recorded in 1997 in the equatorial Pacific Ocean. The sound was called this way because it slowly decreased in frequency over 7 minutes or so. It's been picked out a few more times since it was recorded for the first time. The source of the sound isn't very mysterious. Most likely, it was produced by a massive iceberg that became grounded in Antarctica, or it was caused by moving ice. By that, I mean the friction produced by a large ice sheet moving over land. The loneliest whale sound is often called the 52 Hertz whale because the animal that creates it calls it at a unique for these creatures frequency. When you listen to this sound, it sounds like a low bass note. At the same time, it's much higher than the normal frequency of the whale call, which rings between 10 and 40 hertz. Interestingly, scientists have been listening to the world's loneliest whale for decades, but haven't managed to figure out its precise location. Nobody knows whether the mammal is male or female, what species it is, or if the animal is still alive. After all, for the last time, its call was recorded in 2004. 
earth-shaking booming sounds have been reverberating off some parts of North Carolina for more than 150 years. Called Seneca guns, they're most often heard near the coast. The sounds are so powerful that they often rattle window panes and sometimes vibrate entire buildings. They can last from 1 to almost 10 seconds. Even though scientists haven't cracked this mystery yet, there are some theories. They range from earthquakes to severe distant storms and quarry blasts. But even though the ground trembles every time the phenomenon occurs, no seismic activity coincides with these events. So far, scientists have come to the conclusion that the mysterious sounds happen in the atmosphere, not on or under the surface of our planet. If this theory is true, bolides might be the answer. These extremely bright meteors often explode once they enter Earth's atmosphere. Or, Seneca guns might be born in the ocean. Sometimes, when enormous waves collide far away from the shore, you can hear it, even if you're nowhere near the coast. Seneca guns are a type of skyquakes. You don't need to travel to a particular part of the world to hear one of those. Mysterious sonic booms ramble from the sky everywhere, from the US to India and Japan. Just like Seneca guns, this sound phenomenon occurs mostly near the coast or a big body of water. Rattling glassware and windows in the nearby houses, skyquakes could be connected with ultra-fast airplanes breaking the sound barrier. But people started hearing the first skyquakes in 1824. The theories trying to explain this phenomenon include sand dunes shifting, meteors entering the atmosphere, distant volcanoes erupting, Earth's crust cracking during earthquakes, and even gas bursting out of underground vents in the sea or lake bottom. In different countries all over the world, people get paralyzed with fear after hearing otherworldly trumpet sounds that seem to be coming from the sky. The inhabitants of the US, Canada, Australia, Germany, and the Philippines have already heard this hair-raising noise since it was first recorded in 2008. These sounds are sometimes called the sound of apocalypse. And although until recently, nobody could understand the origin of the sounds, NASA claims that there is nothing to be afraid of. The noise can be coming from our own planet. Usually, it's quiet and thus inaudible to the human ear. But when it gets louder, the outcome is the very trumpet sounds that scare people all over the world. Bristol Hum started in the 1970s when hundreds of Bristol inhabitants began to talk about a bizarre noise audible only at night. The noise was a low-level hum and nobody could identify or trace the source of the sound. But the strangest thing about the noise was that one day, it stopped as abruptly as it started. But not before people in other towns across Britain reported hearing similar sounds. Some time ago, the mysterious sound returned. In 2015, a group of French scientists claimed that they had solved the mystery of the Bristol hum. They stated that the culprit was ocean waves that made the ocean floor vibrate. But while it was all good and well, it didn't explain why the sound was around for only several years or why it chose to return. If you ever come to the town of Taos in New Mexico, don't let another strange and unexplained phenomenon send you running for the hills. This phenomenon is a faint, low-frequency hum ringing in the desert air and grating on your nerves. Even stranger, only 2% of people who live in Taos hear this noise. But for those who do, it's unstoppable torture. On top of that, everyone describes the sound in a different way from a quiet whir to an eerie hum or even persistent buzz. And while some people believe that the Taos hum is the result of unusual acoustics, the others suspect a bad case of mass hysteria. No one has located the origin of the hum yet. Oh wow, there's a hole in the bottom of the ocean. It seems that the ocean has a leak, but it's not like a leak you would expect where water is flowing out. It's more like a spring since water is flowing in, not out. This unique leak is something we know as Pythia's oasis. A grad student was the one who accidentally discovered it. He noticed bubbles that were rising to the surface. Normally, bubbles in the ocean tell us there might be some hydrothermal vents, which are hotspots for some pretty cool things. 
These vents are actually like hot springs on the seafloor. But instead of bubbling with warm water, they release a fluid that has been superheated in the crust of our planet. When seawater seeps into these cracks and travels deep into the crust, it comes into contact with the extremely hot mantle. This heats seawater to very high temperatures, and as it moves back up towards the surface, it carries dissolved gases and minerals. When the hot fluid shoots out of the vents, it mixes with the surrounding seawater and quickly cools down. Just a short distance away from the vent, the temperature can drop to a comfortable 68 degrees Fahrenheit or so, which is, as it seems, exactly what some creatures like. And there are some real weirdos living down there in the darkness, like ghostly fish, giant red-tipped tube worms, and a unique type of shrimp with eyes on their back. And some of them, like tube worms and bacteria, rely on the chemicals and minerals released by the vents to survive in harsh conditions. But in this case, the bubbling water didn't come from a hydrothermal vent. It was there because of a spring, and that's a bit more concerning. You see, the water in this reservoir needs to stay where it is. If too much of it seeps out, there could be some serious consequences, especially for the surrounding area. You can see this unusual leak along the Cascadia subduction zone, which is a massive fault line off the Pacific Northwest coast. It's a place where two pretty big plates that make up Earth's crust come together and slide along each other. The water from Pythia's oasis kind of acts as a lubricant between these plates. You can think of the fault zone as an air hockey table. When the fluid pressure is high, it's like you've turned the air on. That means the friction between the plates is reduced, which allows the plates to move. But if the fluid pressure is lower, the two plates can lock together, which then leads to the buildup of stress. Not that they'll feel bad, in the context of tectonic plates, stress is some pressure or force that can cause deformation. And if this stress starts to build up, at some point, it's got to go somewhere. When it's too much, it can trigger earthquakes and most likely not small ones. For example, a release of stress in the Cascadia subduction zone could lead to a magnitude 9 earthquake. For comparison, the biggest earthquake we've ever recorded happened in Chile in 1960 and it had a magnitude of 9.5. The damage was enormous. So we hope the water will stay in its reservoir and keep maintaining the delicate balance between the tectonic plates. We've explored only 5% of the ocean. Who knows how many cool things are there at the bottom, waiting to be found? For example, check out these mysterious holes scientists have stumbled upon in the depths of the Atlantic Ocean, near the Azores. They're neatly aligned and are about four inches apart, or in some cases, even several feet. They resemble punctures left by a sewing machine. Some think these holes could have a biological origin. For instance, some fish may have made them while walking along the seafloor. Others believe we could be looking at something that's human-made, maybe left by a spiked tire. Of course, such holes are perfect for making up stories about creatures from other planets who allegedly made them. Or maybe even legendary monsters, like that one from Loch Ness. It's definitely hard to explain such symmetry of the holes, but one deep-sea biologist offered a pretty good explanation. He said there could be an animal burrowing beneath the sediment, and from time to time, it could make little chimneys just to get access to clean water circulation in its small burrow. I mean, there are sediment piles around the opening of each hole, and they do support the idea that something pushed the soil from below. But there's still no proof these holes are actually connected beneath the surface. And there are also a lot of things hidden at the bottom of the oceans and seas that ancient civilizations left us. For instance, archaeologists made a really cool discovery off the southern coast of Croatia a road hidden under layers of sea mud that's 7,000 years old. They found the ancient road at the sunken Neolithic site of Solin. The site of Solin was a human-made island in ancient times, and an archaeologist discovered it two years ago. He was studying satellite images of the area around Korčula, one of the beautiful Croatian islands. When he realized there could be something interesting at the bottom of the sea, he dove into the water with his colleague. And under the surface of the Adriatic Sea, which is part of the Mediterranean Sea, at a depth of 13 to 16 feet, 
they found stone walls that were most likely part of some ancient settlement. The landmass where people built the settlement was separated from the main island by a narrow stretch of land. Luckily, this area is protected from big waves by the surrounding islands, so the site remained relatively well preserved. It's now hidden beneath the surface of the sea and covered in mud. But it's so exciting to imagine how people walked on that road nearly 7,000 years ago, visiting nearby settlements. If you want to see the weirdest creatures, you can always head to the bottom of the sea. Actually, scientists have determined there could be more than 30 potentially new species at the bottom of the Pacific Ocean. They've collected them using their remote-controlled vehicle. That's a big step because until recently, they could only study such creatures through photographs. I'm talking about segmented worms, different types of coral, some invertebrates similar to centipedes, and many others. But there are also many old freaky creatures that we already know about that look like they came from sci-fi movies. Red octopus, blobfish, okay this one kind of looks normal until you raise it to the surface, the goblin shark, Sloan's viper fish, zombie worms, ugh, yeah I hear ya, let's move on. The seafloor hides things from space too. There are traces of rare forms of plutonium and iron at the bottom of the Pacific Ocean. And what's awesome is that all this has come from space. These radioactive materials probably formed during some kind of cataclysmic event in space and eventually made their way out to our beautiful home planet. And this extraterrestrial debris most likely appeared on Earth within the past 10 million years. After it fell to the Pacific Ocean and settled at a depth of almost a mile, it became part of all those layers of rock down there. Plutonium is especially exciting for scientists. I mean, only tiny amounts of it have been found. Hundreds of atoms, maybe. But it's still remarkable because these atoms are created by exploding stars. Things like this can help us better understand how the universe produces elements heavier than iron, like plutonium, gold, uranium, and platinum. We're still not sure about the origins of these elements. For a long time, scientists believed that supernovae, which is when a star comes to its end in a fabulous explosion, were responsible for creating these heavy elements. But it seems it's not just that. Some other cosmic events, such as the collision of neutron stars, which are super dense collapsed stars, or some rare types of supernovae, could also be involved. Whoa, let me get my popcorn! Weird, unusual sounds out of nowhere are spreading all over our galaxy, constantly repeating, and it's something we've never heard before. Scientists discovered it in 2020 and it was nothing like any of the other energy signatures they ever studied. Powerful and bright radio signals occurring from time to time, mysteriously disappearing within a day. It doesn't fit the profile of any space body we know. The signal is a bit irritating, and it disappears without a schedule. When scientists tried to match the signal with some other telescopes, it was gone. Low-mass stars sometimes flare up with radio energy, but not here, since they mostly have X-ray counterparts. Very dense collapsed stars, like pulsars and magnetars, are also not a choice. The closest solution they got is a mysterious class of objects we know as the Galactic Center Radio Source, GCRT. It's a radio source that brightens and rapidly glows. It decays near the center of our galaxy and could help us unravel the mysteries of the universe. If you had a flying car that could go up at a speed of 60 miles per hour, you'd only need one hour to get into space. The moon is a little bit farther, 250,000 miles, which is about 10 times the circumference of our planet. That means a moon trip would be like taking a tour around the globe and doing it 10 times straight, which would take less than six months. A trip to Pluto would take over 800 years. Proxima b is the closest Earth-like neighbor we have. It's a small rocky world that orbits the closest stellar neighbor of our Sun. It orbits the star's habitable zone, an area that's far enough from any star to have moderate conditions, not too cold and not too hot for liquid water to at least hypothetically exist. 
if you tried to travel to Proxima b at a speed of 25,000 miles per hour, which is the speed of the Apollo moon rockets, it would take you over 112,000 years to get there. You might not be able to breathe there. No one knows if Proxima b has an atmosphere. Humans explore the universe all the time, but we can only see around 5% of the matter up there. And Albert Einstein was the first one that realized the empty space is not really nothing. The rest we can't see is actually made up of invisible matter, also known as dark matter. It's about 27%. Combined with something called dark energy, which is 68%. If you try to pour water into space, of course, outside of a spacecraft, it would immediately boil away or vaporize. That's because there's no air or air pressure in space. As air pressure lowers, the temperature you'd usually need to boil water at also gets lower. Keeping that in mind, water boils way faster on a mountaintop than, for example, at sea level. There's no air pressure in space, so water could boil at a very low temperature. Scientists believe that there are at least a couple of billion galaxies out there. We don't know the real number, and probably never will, but they tried to calculate it by counting how many galaxies we can see in a pretty small and restricted area of the sky. It may seem as if the universe was filled with stars and a couple of planets here and there, but our home galaxy has at least 100 billion planets. If you fill a balloon with helium and release it, you'll notice it floats very high. It'll go up into the atmosphere, but it won't go into outer space. The higher you go, the thinner the air in our atmosphere gets. Your balloon will rise up until the point where the atmosphere surrounding it has the same weight as the helium inside it. That will happen at approximately a height of 20 miles above the surface. So this is as far as a helium balloon can rise. We don't really know how big the universe is. We can't see its edges, nor do we know if it even has an edge. We use technology to see out to a distance of around 14 billion light years from our planet. This means we can see around 28 billion light years in diameter across, starting with the outermost layer of our atmosphere that ends at around 600 miles above our planet's surface. Although the size of the universe is constantly changing and gets bigger through time. Mercury is closest to the sun, so most people think it's the hottest planet too. Still. Venus is the hottest planet. It's the second planet away from our central star, around 30 million miles farther from the Sun compared to Mercury. Mercury doesn't have an atmosphere, which is like some sort of a warming blanket that helps maintain the heat coming from the Sun. Venus has an unexpectedly thick atmosphere, around 100 times thicker than the one we have. Its atmosphere doesn't let the heat out, it just keeps it and constantly makes Venus hotter and hotter. Also, it mostly consists of carbon dioxide that freely lets solar energy in. But it's less transparent to lose long wavelength radiations that the warm heated surface emits. The average temperature there is around 875 degrees Fahrenheit, which is hot enough to melt tin. The maximum temperature on its neighbor, Mercury, is 800 degrees Fahrenheit. In maybe two or more billion years, it will be way too hot for life to exist on our precious planet. As the hundreds of millions of years go by, our sun will keep getting hotter and brighter. Eventually, temperatures will be so high, our beautiful oceans will be wiped away. Since they produce 70% of the oxygen we need to survive, there will be no life without them. All of this means that our planet will simply become a vast desert something like Mars is today. Pluto, a very distant used-to-be planet, now dwarf planet, is actually smaller in diameter than the entire US. The biggest distance there, from Maine to Northern California, is approximately 2,900 miles, while Pluto is only 1,473 miles across. Pluto is very far, but the edge of our solar system is 1,000 times farther away than this dwarf planet. But astronomers found many space objects orbiting our Sun way farther than Pluto, such as Kuiper Belt objects and trans-Neptunian objects. There's also an Oort comet cloud that goes half a light year from Pluto, also 1,000 times farther. A neutron star is really heavy, 
Just a teaspoon filled with it would weigh 6 billion tons. Neutron stars are something that remain from huge stars that have run out of fuel. The fading star explodes, and its core falls apart. But, due to gravity, it forms an extremely dense neutron star. These stars typically have a mass of up to three suns. But the radius there is around six miles, because this is one of the densest things in our universe, at least that we know about. The universe has a color, and it averages to be some kind of beige, or as they call it, cosmic latte. It also has its own smell that reminds you of seared steak or hot metal. At least, that's something astronauts floating in space have said. If you want to build a spacesuit, get ready to work really hard. It takes 5,000 hours to make it and will cost you a million dollars. A really good one will have 11 layers of material and weighs about 110 pounds. And it needs to be comfortable. You'll need more space in there because you grow up to 2 inches when in space. When you're floating around in space, Earth's gravity doesn't have any impact on you. That's why the vertebrae in your spine might expand and relax a little bit which means you'll be maybe 3% taller. For six feet, it's about two extra inches. Oh, don't worry, it's not permanent. As soon as you go down to Earth, you'll shrink back down to your normal size within a couple of months. Space isn't the best option if you want to have a conversation with your friend. Because up there, sound doesn't travel at all. Molecules there are so far apart that sound vibrations can't reach them which automatically means they can't vibrate, so we can't hear them. Movies are not accurate with this. No one could hear you screaming in space, too. We kind of live inside our sun. The sun is not just that big hot ball of light located 93 million miles away from us. Its outer atmosphere is way bigger. It extends far beyond the surface we can see. Our planet's orbit goes through its tenuous atmosphere. The evidence is when gusts of the solar wind generate the southern and northern lights. That means, in some way, we live inside the sun. Not just us, other planets too, including distant Neptune. The heliosphere, which is what we call the outer solar atmosphere, extends to about 10 billion miles. Incredible news has recently spread across the internet. NASA has discovered evidence of a parallel universe. But is this actually the truth? Well, there is a grain of truth in this story, but it's not that simple. Let's consider it. Perhaps you've seen the articles that said NASA has finally found a parallel universe. The story was widely publicized, and people got divided into two camps. Those who took this news at face value, and those who considered it all complete nonsense. But both sides aren't exactly right. Let's start from the beginning. The discovery was made by NASA's ANITA. This name stands for the Antarctic Impulsive Transient Antenna. Yeah. It was designed to study neutrinos. Neutrinos are high-energy cosmic particles. They're incredibly small, lack any charge, and have almost no mass. Trillions of such particles pass through our bodies every second, and we don't even notice them. All because they almost don't affect ordinary matter. That's how insignificant they are. On average, in our entire life, each of us gets affected by a maximum of one neutrino. So basically, hunting neutrinos is like hunting ghosts. To catch them, you would have to send a whole stream of these particles through a giant piece of lead, and it has to be trillions of miles thick. At the same time, you have a 50-50 chance that you'll stop one of them. Therefore, in order to detect them, Scientists had to come up with some clever tricks. We know that neutrinos, like other similar particles, come to us from outer space. Ooh. They travel to Earth from the Sun, stars, and even from the Big Bang itself. Some of them come to us from particularly big sources, such as black holes, supernova, pulsars, and even from various unidentified objects. Some of these particles have particularly high energy. And for scientists, these neutrinos are the most interesting ones. But oddly enough, most high-energy neutrinos don't actually come to us from afar. They form right here, next to Earth. This process has a cute name, particle shower. Well, this is how you can explain it in simple words. 
a granny particle gets into Earth's atmosphere. Usually, it's a particle with very high energy. Then, it generates several children that have less energy. Each of them then makes more grandchildren, whose energy is even less than theirs, and so on, until we have a giant family tree of low-energy particles. In the end, there may be billions of them. During this process, piles of neutrinos are created. Then, they begin to sink deep into our Earth. During their journey through the planet, they touch the upper layers of its crust, or ice, for example, Antarctica's ice. When faced with all these obstacles, they create radio pulses. And as you might have guessed, these are the exact radio pulses that scientists are trying to find. It may be a surprise to you, but Antarctica is pretty deserted, you think? And that's why it's the best place to study microscopic particles, which usually can barely be traced. There won't be any interference or anything like that. We can catch these pulses with the help of powerful antennas. NASA places these antennas on balloons that can rise as much as 20 miles above Earth's surface. That's how they've been tracking these neutrinos for the past years. Alright, now we know what Anita is doing. But what about that parallel universe stuff? Nah, don't worry, we're getting there. In 2018, Anita began receiving abnormal radio signals that caused quite a stir in the scientific community. Remember how neutrinos come to us from outer space and then gradually sink deep into our planet? So recently, Anita has discovered neutrinos that didn't descend from space as usual, but rather rose up from Earth. In other words, these particles called tau neutrinos basically travel back in time. But how is this possible? Scientists began to research them. At first, they thought that maybe it was a detector error or an error in interpreting the data. But no, everything was correct. Something very exotic was happening. If so, then first we must try to find a simple explanation. What if these tau neutrinos just came to Antarctica from some other source? Maybe they came to Earth from the other side and somehow passed through the boundary. To test this theory, scientists decided to seek help from another cool neutrino observatory called Ice Cube. Yes, very cool! This observatory is located near the South Pole. It consists of 5,160 optical detectors buried in ice, and all these powerful detectors are designed to detect neutrinos. Anita researchers were like, hey guys, we found some strange radio signals. Could you please check where they come from? No problem, Ice Cube replied and started the research. And as a result, they found nothing. Yep, Ice Cube didn't detect any signal sources at all. It turned out that these strange particles had basically appeared out of nowhere. How could this be? Scientists tested many different theories, but none of them could explain the situation accurately. Later, Ice Cube published an article which basically said, nope, we have no idea where these signals came from and how to explain them in terms of the standard model of the universe. Oh, now it's getting interesting. So what on Earth are these signals? Having exhausted normal explanations, scientists began to consider ideas that go beyond our understanding. One of them said that perhaps these particles had come to us from a parallel universe where time flows in the opposite direction. This crazy-sounding theory is the result of the famous multiverse theory. According to it, about 14 billion years ago, when the Big Bang happened, two twin universes were born. One of them was ours, and the other was a parallel one. And they're almost identical in everything, except for some things. For example, time in this parallel universe doesn't move in the same way as it does in ours. It moves backward. Besides, everything there would look upside down to us, as if we're looking in a mirror. Therefore, scientists call it the antiverse and believe it could be filled with antimatter. And even though all this may seem strange and crazy to us, for those who live in that antiverse, their way of life would be quite normal. In fact, they would rather find us, the strange ones. So these mysterious neutrinos could be born in this antiverse. Let's say they somehow existed there and then accidentally got into our world, where we were able to detect them. The idea of the multiverse itself is really incredible. If it's true, then it may mean that there is an infinite number of realities, many of which are much better than ours. 
Quantum mechanics even says that it's quite possible that every second of every day, any of your decisions divides the universe into two. And so there are quintillions of parallel universes where our lives have gone very differently. Something like this is hard to even imagine. Of course, it would be great if we could find a way to get into another universe. And if these mysterious tau neutrino particles were able to cross the boundaries of two worlds, well, maybe we can do that too? But unfortunately, this phenomenon alone isn't enough to say whether the multiverse theory is true or not. This is just one of several possible options. At this stage of human development, we cannot prove or disprove this theory. Maybe someday in the future, we'll find out the truth, but definitely not now. The only thing we can say now, after this discovery, is that we've found strange radio signals which standard physics can't explain. So we need to move in this direction and study them to learn more about this incredible phenomenon. But people like to dream about space, so no wonder we've gotten so excited about this. And it would be great if one day it turned out that this theory was actually true. The theory of parallel universes has been popular in various movies and books for a very long time. Where would you go if you found out that you could travel between realities? Me? I'd look for a different reality of ice cream. <laughs>How would you describe the shape of the planet we live on? It's definitely round, but it's not a perfect sphere. Because of the force of Earth's rotation, it's slightly flat on the North and South Pole. But there's more to it. The planet's rotation causes its sides to bulge outwards. The best term to describe our home planet is ellipsoid. Earth is nothing more than an oversized lumpy potato. These are the words of Atraji Ghosh, a solid Earth geophysicist from Bangalore. She and her team have been studying something called the Indian Ocean Gravity Hole. Sounds like the scenario for a science fiction movie, but it's very much real. We think of gravity as something consistent. If you drop a pen from your hand in Los Angeles and in Perth, they're going to fall to the floor at the same time. Well, this is not completely true. Gravity is connected with the mass of a celestial body. Astronauts on the surface of our moon don't walk, but move in hops. That's because Earth weighs 81 times more than the moon. Less mass means less gravity. Earth is more massive, so it has a stronger gravitational pull. But there's a catch. All this mass isn't distributed evenly across the planet. As a result, gravity varies as well. NASA has been mapping Earth's gravity field since 2002 using twin GRACE satellites. The maps they produced show where gravity is stronger and where it's weaker. Mountain ranges such as the Himalayas contain a lot of mass. This means they generate a stronger gravity field. The opposite happens in ocean trenches. The deepest of them is the Mariana Trench in the Pacific Ocean. You could almost stack two Mount Kilimanjaros inside it. The low concentration of Earth's mass below it means that the gravity field here is weaker. Places on the globe where huge chunks of mass are missing are called geoid lows. A geoid is an imaginary surface that follows the outline of sea levels around our planet. Imagine the Earth without any land. That shouldn't be too hard since the nickname of our home is Blue Planet. Now draw a curvy line along the surface of the oceans, and you get a geoid. In reality, the line stretches across oceans, as well as land masses. Scientists use this imaginary line to calculate the depth of tremors or objects that occur underground. When the wavy line goes down, that's a geoid low. The biggest of them sits at the bottom of the Indian Ocean. The first to discover it was a Dutch geophysicist in 1948. He was performing a gravity survey from a ship. The man noticed that sea levels dipped over 320 feet below the global average. The gravity hole got the official name Indian Ocean Geoid Low. It spans well over a million square miles off the southern coast of India. If you went out at sea in the middle of the gravity hole, you wouldn't notice much. Just an endless ocean as far as the eye could see. The only way to measure the dip in gravity is through extensive geophysical measurements and calculations. 
The concept of a gravitational hole existed for nearly two centuries in the scientific community, but researchers could study it in high detail only after satellite measurements became possible in the late 20th century. A team of Indian scientists was determined to explain the anomaly that had been puzzling geologists for decades. They used supercomputers to simulate the seismic activity that formed our planet. A total of 19 simulations revealed how tectonic plates moved across the span of over 140 million years. This was during the Cretaceous period, the time when T. rex roamed the Earth. Nearly a third of the possible scenarios produced a geoid low, similar to the one in the Indian Ocean. The most important factor in these models was the presence of magma plumes. These are places inside the Earth's mantle where lava flows upwards. The mantle sits between the planet's outer core and the thin crust we walk upon. The magma in the mantle plume is hotter than the surrounding rocks. The heat it generates melts and thins the crust. This creates hotspots that are brimming with volcanic activity. Yellowstone National Park and the Hawaiian Islands sit atop such hotspots. The Indian team of scientists linked the presence of magma plumes to the formation of the geoid low. Their source was an ancient ocean that disappeared tens of millions of years ago. It was located where the Himalayan mountain range sits today. Evidence of this lie in the marine rocks researchers found on the world's tallest mountains. The oceans ceased to exist when India's landmass separated from the supercontinent called Gondwana. It drifted north and merged with the rest of the Asian continent. At the time, the Eurasian supercontinent was called Laurasia. The Indian tectonic plate went down inside the mantle. It ended up under the African continent. This landmass contained a lot of crystallized material, which was quite dense. When the sinking plate of the former ocean reached it, plumes of magma spilled out. As a result, low-density materials ended up closer to Earth's surface. Density is used to calculate mass, and if you remember our lesson in physics from the beginning of the video, less mass translates into a weaker gravity field. Scientists believe this is how the geoid low in the Indian Ocean formed some 20 million years ago. At this point in prehistory, the Earth looked a lot like it does today. There were vast grasslands, and whales swam in the seas. Geophysicists who created the computer model cannot tell for sure what will happen in the future. Ghosh thinks it's possible that the gravity hole in the Indian Ocean will remain in place for a long time. But plate movements can also cause the anomaly to fully disappear in the coming eons. Earth's tectonic plates are constantly shifting. They define the shape of our continents and oceans. Experts study plate movements to get a picture of how our world looked millions of years ago. However, telling Earth's geologic future is much more complex. The gravity hole in the Indian Ocean is the biggest, but it's not the only one in the world. Other areas with low gravity include the island of Cuba and the Bahamas. On the opposite side of the spectrum are the Philippines. Here, gravity is stronger than normal, but the poles are the places with the strongest pull to them. They are the closest to the center of the Earth. If you stand directly on the North or the South Pole, you are 3,950 miles from the planet's core. At sea level on the equator, this distance increases by more than 13 miles. Earth's gravitational field also has an effect on your weight. At the equator, you weigh 1% less than you do on the poles. The South Pole is maybe more suitable for this experiment because there is actually ground there. But gravity is the strongest at the North Pole in the middle of the Arctic Ocean. This is where scientists in 2013 recorded the highest gravitational acceleration on the planet. This is the rate a falling object speeds up in free fall. The acceleration depends on the strength of gravity. When a team of researchers from a university in Perth set out to map these gravity changes, they discovered something interesting. Gravitational acceleration was the highest at the surface of the Arctic Ocean. This is something they expect to find, but the location of the lowest acceleration point amazed them. It wasn't on the equator as they assumed. The spot lay more than 600 miles south of it at Mount Huascarú in Peru. Scientists believe that the mountain's height had an effect on the phenomenon. 
this peak in the Andes is the highest point in the South American country. Hypothetically speaking, if a human falls from a height of 330 feet here, they will reach the ground 16 milliseconds later than if they performed the same stunt in the Arctic. On a sunny day, a man was diving in shallow waters near South Africa. At one point, he saw something that didn't catch his eye at first. A pile of shells that looked as if it had been put together. Maybe by some other diver, he must have told himself. But out of all these shells came the most unusual of creatures, an octopus. The gorgeous underwater animal looked straight at the man before swimming away. Impressed by his new acquaintance, the diver started visiting the octopus every day. He watched it use shells and seaweed to protect itself and learned how it hunted and cared for its eggs. All these encounters became the basis for a now famous documentary. In the movie, the diver wanted to study the relationship between a wild octopus and its observer. Initially, the octopus was a bit too shy to let the man get close. But over time, it began to trust him and even explored his body. At one point, the octopus even rested on the diver's chest. The man soon began to look at the underwater creature as his octopus friend. Sure, the documentary did make it look like a true friendship, but that was most likely because of all the close-ups and eerie music. But you can't really know what the octopus is thinking. Maybe what looks like tenderness is just curiosity or confusion. Maybe an apparent hug is really just a defense mechanism. Some people may love octopuses, but can they really be friends with a human? Until they learn to talk, I guess we'll never know. That doesn't make an octopus less of an interesting creature though. Apart from those quirky sets of tentacles, obviously octopuses have another characteristic that sets them apart from other sea creatures. A recent study that involved studying the footage of octopuses living underwater shows that they sometimes develop this unusual behavior. They seem to throw things at each other on purpose. It can be anything from dirt from the bottom of the sea to shells or rocks. Octopuses are known to be solitary creatures, so when something or someone like an underwater camera person gets too close to them, they might lash out. Just as we have yet to discover the limits of our galaxies and constellations, we know very little about the bottom of the sea. It's one of the reasons why we find it so hard to explain the behavior of some underwater creatures. The truth is, we don't have good enough technology able to deal with harsh conditions and a limited amount of light underwater. You might have asked yourself at one point, what's the deepest part of the ocean? It's called the Mariana Trench. We don't really know exactly how deep this giant hole is since it's too difficult to measure, but it's somewhere around 6.8 miles deep and five times longer than the Grand Canyon. This massive underwater trench was first studied back in 1875 with the help of a weighted rope. Back in 2012, a Canadian film director reached the bottom of the trench in a submersible vessel called the Deep Sea Challenger. Some of the most bizarre creatures on the planet were discovered here, including the Dumbo octopus, the sea cucumber, and the goblin shark. The Mariana Trench got its name from the nearby Mariana Islands, which were named Las Marianas in honor of Spanish Queen Mariana of Austria. The Mariana Trench might be the deepest part of the ocean that we know of, but one other mysterious phenomenon that's interesting for researchers is called phantom bottoms. In the late 1940s, when the sonar became standard equipment, ships and submarines noticed unexpected signals coming from the ocean. Those signals came from areas where no seafloor was supposed to exist. What's even more mysterious is that this fake seafloor appeared to move. One researcher at Scripps University found out that these phantom bottoms showing on maps were indeed alive. They were made out of a layer of jellyfish, shrimps, and other deep sea creatures. The reason why they move is that they rise to the surface at night to feed. To top it all off, even the way these creatures move is kinda calculated. 
They don't just move randomly, but seem to gather together by species. We used to believe underwater animals behave this way only to avoid being caught by predators. It's a mystery to scientists why they group in the same way to form a fake seabed. Our curiosity about the deep waters doesn't stop at the seafloor. If you went on a vacation to the beach when you were young, you probably remember the fun of digging in the sand. As the hole got deeper, you may have asked yourself, could I dig all the way to the other side of the earth? None of us have ever found out. Our parents took us home when it got dark and chilly. Scientists are more reasonable when it comes to this subject. For starters, they know the best place to start digging would be underwater, since those regions are already deeper than what we can find on land. They also do not have the ambition to drill a tunnel through Earth. It's not even possible. That's mostly because of the extreme heat and pressure inside our planet. Even if we could technically dig a tunnel, it would not be safe to travel through it. However, reaching the mantle and retrieving a sample would be a huge scientific achievement, similar to landing on the moon. What we live on is called Earth's crust. Underneath it, there are other layers called the mantle, outer core and inner core. Researchers have been trying to drill into Earth's mantle since the 1960s, but they haven't succeeded. Some failed due to technical issues, and others were unlucky and chose the wrong places to drill. Our planet's mantle is made of molten rock. Wouldn't that be dangerous if we ever reached it? Scientists say we have nothing to worry about, though. If and when the drillers eventually pierce through the crust underwater, hot molten rock won't pop up the hole and spill onto the seafloor like it would during a volcanic eruption. Mantle rocks aren't solid, sure, but they move slowly, at the same speed as your fingernails grow. Another of those famous deep sea mysteries is that of the 1997 bloop. You heard that right. I'm talking about a weird sound that seemed to come from deep under the waves. People heard it in the South Pacific. No one had ever recounted a sound like that before. Some thought it must have been emitted by a strange creature living deep in the ocean. It didn't help that the noise came from a location mentioned in a story by famous writer H.P. Lovecraft. In his story, it was a creature called Cthulhu that lived there. In the novel, the author described it as a large, human-like monster with tentacles on its face and wings on its back. For many years, people tried to figure out where the noise came from. It wasn't until 2005 that they concluded it was from icebergs breaking off of glaciers. Some people still don't believe that this explanation truly makes sense and are searching for a different reason for the blue. If creatures living outside of our planet ever decided to come to visit, you wouldn't expect them to go straight to the bottom of the sea, right? Well, some people claim there's a sort of spaceship on the ocean floor discovered in 2011. It's basically an oval-shaped object located on the bottom of the Baltic Sea. In 2012, a team of divers explored the anomaly and found what appeared to be a staircase and other structures on its surface. This only added to the belief that the large object had been made by someone and wasn't just a natural phenomenon. Even more bizarre, close to the unidentified anomaly, the explorer's electrical equipment, like sonar instruments and satellite phones, started to malfunction. Some scientists believe it just to be a glacial deposit or some other natural formation, but they still don't know for sure what it is. Hey, don't freak out. Those red waters you see aren't blood oceans. It's just a natural occurrence called the red tide. Red tides often happen in Florida, especially in the West Florida Shelf, and they can stick around for weeks or even months. They're basically caused by an increase in algae levels, hence the color. Those algae produce toxins that can be harmful to marine life. They can also be bad news for us humans, causing symptoms like upset stomach and uh, urgent bathroom trips, if you're picking up what I'm putting down. Volcanoes are super scary, but there's nothing scarier than getting taken out by a pyroclastic flow. 
These fiery flows move crazy fast and reach insane temperatures, like hotter than your oven on a pizza night. They're like a fireworks show of volcanic eruptions filled with ash, lava, and hot gas, speeding down mountains at 50 miles per hour. Some researchers claim they might even hit speeds of 450 miles per hour, almost as fast as a passenger jet. If you're unlucky enough to be in the path of a flow, you're in big trouble. The heat alone can turn you into a human barbecue, even if you try to hide in a building. The air around the flow can reach temperatures high enough to fry your insides, burn your clothes off, and leave metal melted into your skin, which almost sounds like a Marvel origin story. However, a lot of people have met their end because of these flows. But there's one crazy story about a guy named Luger Silbaris, still sounding like an origin story. So on the 7th of May, 1902, there was a major eruption on the island of Martinique. The night before, Silbaris had gotten into trouble and ended up in jail. Maybe this is a villain origin story. He'd been locked in a sturdy cell facing away from the volcano. The next morning, Mount Pella unexpectedly erupted, destroying St. Pierre within minutes. The flows wiped out around 30,000 people, but Silbaris survived in his cell and became known as the guy who lived through doomsday. The rescue team found him four days later. By the way, the cell still stands today. I hope somebody tested him for superpowers. Back on August 21st, 1986, a guy stumbled upon some animals showing no signs of life on his way to Neos village in Cameroon. To his shock, he later found out that everyone in the village had mysteriously passed away. The same thing happened at Lake Manon in 1984. Turns out, those tragic incidents were caused by something called limnic eruptions, which are pretty rare disasters where carbon dioxide suddenly bursts out of lake waters creating a hazardous gas cloud. These type of eruptions usually happen in lakes with high levels of CO2, which can be caused by things like volcanic gases and high pressure. Any little change in temperature or pressure can set off an eruption. So, experts have started looking into ways to safely release CO2 from lakes, like Manown and Nios, in order to lower the risk of more disasters in the future. In March 2024, a video captured a terrifying moment of a woman disappearing into a sinkhole while browsing through a Chinese department store. Guess she got more than she bargained for. <laughs> Moving on. The scene unfolded as the floor beneath her gave way, sending her plummeting into the abyss. In the midst of the chaos, another customer frantically ran away before returning to check on the woman who had fallen. Their quick thinking and the swift response of emergency crews and firefighters saved the day resulting in only minor injuries for both women. I'm glad that lady checked on her because I would be gone. An anvil cloud is basically a big cloud made of ice particles that forms at the top of really tall thunderstorms, or those huge cumulonimbus clouds. The flat top shape is caused by the air rising in the storm and spreading out when it hits the stratosphere. That's why it's called an anvil. It looks like the tool metal workers use, duh. The air from the anvil cloud is cooler than the stratosphere air, which keeps it from going any higher. You can spot anvil clouds from really far away, sometimes over 100 miles. Often you might see streaks of snow coming from the edge of the cloud known as virga. The snow disappears before hitting the ground because of the dry air. If you notice clouds poking through the flat top or bubbling up, it's an overshooting top, a sign of a super strong storm. Anvils are known for producing dangerous lightning. Normally, lightning comes from the bottom of a storm, but anvil clouds can produce really powerful lightning from the top. This lightning can strike out of nowhere, even from up to 30 miles away. So keep an eye on those anvil clouds if you see one forming nearby. Lahars are no joke. They're basically fast-moving, super dangerous streams of rock, ash, and water that come down the slopes of volcanoes. It's important for everyone to be aware of them. Scientists, policymakers, and even us regular folks. By understanding how lahars work and their potential impact, we can try to stay safe when volcanoes start acting up. Saving lives during natural disasters is the name of the game. There are two main types of lahars. Debris lahars and mudflow lahars. 
Debris lahars are full of solid stuff like rocks and ash, while mudflow lahars are more waterlogged and sludgy. Lahars can be triggered by the rapid melting of snow or ice, heavy rain falling on loose volcanic material, or even a crater lake eruption. The volcano's characteristics and presence of water are key factors in how lahars form and move downhill. When lahars come barreling down mountains at speeds of up to 120 miles per hour, carrying loads of debris, it's a recipe for disaster. Unless you have a surfboard, but I doubt you'll have a surfboard on a volcano. Just saying. Also, it won't work. Going to the beach for a sunny vacation is the best. There's nothing like basking in the sun, feeling sand between your toes, and hearing waves crash against the shore. But even though it's all relaxing and picture perfect, always keep an eye on the water and never turn your back on the ocean. You may know about rip currents and tides, but have you ever heard of square waves? It's a real thing, and it can be pretty scary. Square waves, also known as cross seas, happen when two swells meet, forming a unique square pattern that looks like a checkerboard. They can be found along coastal areas, and while they are rare, they can create waves up to 10 feet high and make it tough for boats and swimmers to maneuver. If you find yourself in the water with square waves, you might feel like you're fighting against two different currents. The best thing to do is to not go too far out to begin with and get out of the water as soon as the waves become too strong. Square waves are more dangerous for boats and ships, so it's best to stick to the shallow waters and stay safe. Whirlpools and maelstroms are powerful natural forces that have scared sailors for years. They happen when certain weather and current conditions come together just right. Most of them are safe if you stay away, but let's see what they really are and how they form. A whirlpool is basically water that starts spinning when two currents meet or one current hits something solid like a wall. They can be big or small, depending on the speed of the water and waves. Most aren't dangerous, but there are also maelstroms, which are large, forceful, and violent whirlpools, caused by ocean tides and narrow straits. Tidal currents in places like Norway's Saltströmmen and Mokströmmen can create massive whirlpools. Scotland's Korovrekken whirlpool is one of the world's largest. Other examples of whirlpools can be found in Japan, Canada, and New Zealand. Are they portals? They're definitely not portals. Researchers have recently looked into ancient underwater volcanic eruptions and how they affected Earth's climate. They studied materials from Bronze Age eruptions to learn more about their scale, dangers, and impact on climate. For example, one eruption about 3,600 years ago in the Aegean Sea caused chaos in Santorini. The study focused on this event to understand its importance. By analyzing volcanic deposits, the researchers gained insights into how future eruptions could affect climate. They discovered that sediment waves from shallow underwater eruptions could lead to tsunamis and impact the ocean floor. These findings help us understand how underwater volcanic eruptions relate to the marine environment, which can help us predict climate changes in the future. Ever wonder why, despite all our advancements in technology and science, there's a vast expanse of our own planet that we barely know about? Believe it or not, over 80% of our oceans remain uncharted territory. It's as if we've got this massive aquatic playground in our backyard and we've barely scratched the surface. Also, did you know that only about 7% of our oceans have a special tag called Marine Protected Areas, or MPAs? How come this colossal body of water that envelops most of our planet is also among the most vulnerable and misunderstood spaces in the universe? Pressure has a lot to do with it. Our deep ocean is a beast of a place with no visibility, freezing temperatures, and pressure that's so intense that in certain areas, it would make you feel like you're having the weight of 50 jumbo jets on your body. No wonder we're having an easier time sending people into space than to the bottom of the ocean. The deeper you go into the waters, the more pressure piles up. But let's not forget we have tech on our side, right? Scientists now use these cool satellite technologies that track the color of the ocean to check how much phytoplankton is there, for example. Why is this important, you might ask? Because these little plant-like critters are actually pretty major players in our big blue oceans. 
In the grand scheme of things, in the aquatic world, phytoplankton is like the bedrock of the ocean food chain. It gives life to almost everything, from the tiny zooplankton, which are animal-like microorganisms, to those colossal, magnificent whales. When these technologies first came around, satellites could get clear images of the ocean faster than a ship could take the same number of measurements in 10 years. But it's not all about looking at the ocean from space. Sometimes you gotta dive in there and see it for yourself. Thankfully, we've come a long way in ocean exploration tech too. We've got things like floats and drifters that ride the ocean currents while collecting data, and a whole fleet of underwater vehicles, some of which are manned, some remote controlled, and some even autonomous. Remember James Cameron, the guy who made the movie Titanic? He's super into exploring the ocean, and in 2012, he set a record by going down to the Mariana Trench in a vertical torpedo sub. He thinks there's nothing like being in the ocean and experiencing it firsthand. Other companies use a mix of technologies for their ocean explorations. It led them to discover amazing stuff like a deep sea coral reef near Morocco, the only one still growing in the Mediterranean Sea. They've also discovered new species and documented ones previously thought to live only in the Atlantic. These efforts have convinced the local authorities to declare some places as marine parks. As with most scientific areas, the road isn't without its bumps. These expeditions can cost quite a lot, and the lack of detailed maps and data only adds to the challenge. We can't always rely on bathymetric information, meaning the study of the ocean floor, because it's often not available. And that's the tricky part. We need to explore more to know more, but getting the funds for these kinds of projects can be tough when there are so many unknown variables. One particular company's explorations have helped protect nearly 4 million square miles of ocean so far. The data they collect during their expeditions is invaluable. It's used to identify new species, locate vulnerable habitats, and even show where threatened species are being overlooked. Their work helps dismiss excuses from local authorities who claim they lack the necessary information to establish more MPAs. The same company supports a goal known as 30 by 30, aiming to protect 30% of our oceans by 2030. It's a big target and there's a long road ahead, but ongoing ocean exploration can provide the proof needed to keep more of our oceans safe. We also need to set aside areas for protection and research even when we don't have all the facts just yet. On that note, some cool scientists have recently stumbled upon a gigantic and mysterious world beneath the Pacific Northwest Coast's ocean floor. The best part is, this massive realm of life is pretty much cut off from the rest of the world above, making it like a secret underground club that only the best microbiologists have access to. Picture an active city. Except the city is microscopic cracks in the basalt rocks of our oceanic crust, and its residents are microbes. These tiny creatures aren't like you and me. They don't rely on sunlight or the organic products of land and water ecosystems for sustenance. Instead, they thrive on chemical reactions with rocks and seawater. Scientists call this type of life chemosynthetic. Which sounds complicated, but it basically means life sustained by chemical reactions. While this sort of life has been found deep in mines and around seafloor hydrothermal vents, the scale at which these creatures are found under the oceanic crust is unprecedented. It might even be the most extensive ecosystem on Earth. A geomicrobiologist from Denmark was part of the team that made this discovery. He claimed that over 50% of our planet's surface is oceanic crust, which is an average of 4 miles thick. Imagine the size of this chemosynthetic party happening down there. This discovery didn't happen overnight. Since the 90s, scientists have found weird tiny holes in the basalt rocks that make up much of Earth's outer crust. They seem like they might have been made by bacteria. But hey, there was supposed to be no life there. I mean, imagine trying to survive in a place that's hot, deep, dark, dense, and mostly devoid of the organic compounds we need for life. Yet, here they are. In the following years, more pieces of the puzzle fell into place. 
scientists found that the oceanic crusts had different conditions at the centers and edges. At the centers, rocks are jam-packed with energy-rich compounds that support these tiny life forms. But by the time they reach the edges, these chemicals are all gone. Fast forward to now, and it's time to put the puzzle together. A microbial ecologist from the University of North Carolina worked on this research and says we now have solid evidence of microbial life in the cracks and crevices of deep ocean basalt. The next question scientists asked was, how far does this life extend? Researchers collected samples of crust from a plate roughly 120 miles off of Washington's coast, drilling deep beneath the ocean's surface. What they found down there was remarkable. The life down there runs on a unique fuel, hydrogen. Yep, in the absence of sunlight, hydrogen provides the energy for all their biological processes. These microbes use hydrogen to transform carbon dioxide into organic matter. This matter and other byproducts, like methane, then fuel other organisms, creating a network of life. Of course, the life down there isn't as complex as the one we know up here. Scientists doubt there will be any multicellular life under the ocean because it's too hot and energy poor. But hey, who knows? This universe under our oceans still has a lot to reveal. This whole thing is significant for many reasons. First, it confirms that life can exist in places without oxygen, which changes our perspective on where we can find life. This makes us wonder if life could exist under similar conditions on other planets, where surface conditions might be too harsh. The implications on Earth are also profound. If a large portion of life exists in the oceanic crust, then our understanding of life on our own planet could be completely changed. This exciting discovery stretches our understanding of life and prompts us to keep exploring the mysterious depths of our oceans, pushing the limits of our understanding. NASA is also in on the whole deep sea exploration project. Why? Shouldn't they be preoccupied with outer space? Because they're hoping to find hints about what the oceans on other planets might look like. NASA specialists are really hopeful that by unearthing underwater secrets, we can solve some of the big questions about space. Plus, they're testing some nifty equipment for future journeys across our solar system. Many terrifying animals live deep beyond the waves, like this vampire squid living 3,000 feet below the surface in almost complete darkness. This animal has a cloak, like a vampire's. That's why it's called the vampire squid. Deep down at the bottom, it can't use ink to defend itself. So this animal has developed an unusual tactic. It glows slightly to scare away predators. If this tactic fails, the vampire squid can turn its body inside out, revealing tiny spikes. When you translate its scientific name, Vampirotuthis infernalis, it literally means vampire squid from the nether. Despite its terrifying looks, it's a harmless ocean animal. This previous creature was not from space, but this object definitely is. Before Elon Musk found a way to reuse rockets, NASA would simply drop old ones after launching astronauts into space, most of the time in the ocean or deserts. In 2012, Jeff Bezos launched a mission to find the Apollo 11 rocket. They found it by using sonar, but it was in terrible condition. It was sitting on the bottom of the ocean, not far from the predicted site. They were able to rescue the engine and reconstruct two of them. The most famous lost city is Atlantis, but sadly, we still haven't discovered it. However, Heraklion was also just a myth until one British pilot saw something that looked like a city while flying over the Mediterranean Sea. He reported it, and 60 years later, a group of divers went there. They were shocked when they found an entire city underwater. It was loaded with artifacts that could tell us a lot about the history of the place. Now it's one of the best underwater archaeological sites in the world. It's believed that the rising sea caused the whole city to go underwater. The Titanic sank in 1912. The wreck was claimed to be officially discovered 74 years later. 
In reality, though, a fisherman found the Titanic eight years earlier while fishing in the Atlantic Ocean. He was pulling out his net when he spotted a head stuck in it. Luckily, it was just a doll's head. Years later, after the fisher had passed away, his son sold the doll to a doll collector. She did a lot of digging and research on every person who had a porcelain toy on the Titanic. She found the owner of the doll. Ava Hart was on the Titanic and had a doll with her. Ava survived the catastrophe by a miracle, but her toy didn't. Hart even wrote about the doll in her journal, and every detail matched the toy found by the fisherman. The tripod fish lives deep in the abyssal zone, around 20,000 feet below the surface. It's adapted to such immense depths and uses its tripod fins to stay still on the bottom. This creature doesn't have big eyes, but even if it did, these eyes would be useless in the darkness. Instead, the tripod fish uses its fins like antennas to detect any movement in the water. This creature doesn't have much luck when it comes to its love life, so it had to develop unique tactics to reproduce. One fish can be both male and female. The next bizarre creature is the lizard fish. It has tons of razor sharp teeth, a huge mouth and really big eyes, which it uses for hunting. All this makes the animal look freaky. The lizard fish lives at depths of around 11,000 feet in the midnight zone where there is zero light. This freak of nature basically eats everything it can fit inside its mouth, from small fish to other lizard fish. On the other hand, when they see other reptile fish, they probably fall in love instead because finding mates at those depths is not an easy task. Like the tripod fish, the lizard fish can be both male and female at the same time. When you think of a river, you usually picture it on land. Still, nature is quite unpredictable, and it created a river flowing under the ocean in California. It's running at a depth of around two miles. This river has everything that an ordinary river has, sunken logs, trees, and rocks. And despite its uniqueness, it's not the only one in the world. There are also others in the Amazon and Greenland. A terrifying creature was discovered near Angola's coast by a remote operating vehicle. It looks like it doesn't have a head or a body. It was sitting at a depth of around 4,350 feet below the surface. After doing research, scientists concluded it wasn't anything from a sci-fi movie, it was just a cluster of siphonophores stuck together. In 2015, some random guy was diving in Caesarea, and something shiny caught his eye. He reached out, grabbed it, and realized it was a gold coin. After that, he examined the bottom and found out that there were many more. He reported the incident to the local authorities, and they concluded that he had found Arabic treasure. The coins were made of solid 24 karat gold and were a few thousand years old, but due to the perfect salinity and temperature, they looked brand new. The coins belonged to a ship carrying cargo. It was caught up in a storm and unfortunately sank. One of the weirdest things ever discovered was found in the Baltic Sea. It's an anomaly that looks as if it was created by a different civilization. It was discovered by Swedish researchers and they basically had no idea what it was. They had to ask tons of other scientists for their opinions. When you look at this formation from above, it's 200 feet long and looks exactly like a fallen spaceship. It's hard to believe that it's a natural formation, but spoiler alert, it's totally made by nature because the Baltic Sea has gone through many erosions throughout history. Most likely, the bizarre formation is the result of these processes. A group of divers in Madagascar were shocked when they found this seven-foot monstrosity of a knife on the seafloor. The speculation started immediately, and many said that the knife was from some giants that had fought megalodons and lived on Earth thousands and thousands of years ago. That could make a nice story, but the knife is most likely a movie prop that was lost at sea. 
One of the ocean's most bizarre animals is the frilled shark. It's believed that this fish is the reason for all those sea serpent stories that sea explorers of the past wrote about. These animals live pretty deep in the ocean, but sometimes they can be seen in shallow waters. It's super rare, but possible. The frilled shark has a big mouth sporting around 300 teeth. It also has a long body that looks like a lizard's, and it is truly a unique species of shark. Its prey can be half of its size because this shark's stomach is like that of a snake, and it can swallow huge fish or crustaceans. Spotting a few worms in your garden is no big deal, but after seeing a 26-foot long one in the ocean, you will make your wetsuit a little wetter. This worm is super rare, and it's completely harmless to humans. It's actually not a giant worm. It's a cluster of zooids that are stuck together in a worm-shaped formation. They usually only eat plankton, bacteria, and other tiny things that can be found in the ocean. Probably the scariest thing in the ocean that is 100% real is the Magna Pinna, which can be found at crazy depths of 20,000 feet below the surface. This monster looks like an underwater slender man, but it's just a squid with really long tentacles that can reach a terrifying size of 8 feet. This guy has only been seen a few times, and basically, we don't know much about this creature so far. Oh wow, there's a hole in the bottom of the ocean! It seems that the ocean has a leak, but it's not like a leak you would expect, where water is flowing out. It's more like a spring since water is flowing in, not out. This unique leak is something we know as Pythia's Oasis. A grad student was the one who accidentally discovered it. He noticed bubbles that were rising to the surface. Normally, bubbles in the ocean tell us there might be some hydrothermal vents, which are hotspots for some pretty cool things. These vents are actually like hot springs on the seafloor, but instead of bubbling with warm water, they release a fluid that has been superheated in the crust of our planet. When seawater seeps into these cracks and travels deep into the crust, it comes into contact with the extremely hot mantle. This heats seawater to very high temperatures, and as it moves back up towards the surface, it carries dissolved gases and minerals. When the hot fluid shoots out of the vents, it mixes with the surrounding seawater and quickly cools down. Just a short distance away from the vent, the temperature can drop to a comfortable 68 degrees Fahrenheit or so, which is, as it seems, exactly what some creatures like. And there are some real weirdos living down there in the darkness, like ghostly fish, giant red-tipped tube worms, and a unique type of shrimp with eyes on their back. And some of them, like tube worms and bacteria, rely on the chemicals and minerals released by the vents to survive in harsh conditions. But in this case, the bubbling water didn't come from a hydrothermal vent. It was there because of a spring, and that's a bit more concerning. You see, the water in this reservoir needs to stay where it is. If too much of it seeps out, there could be some serious consequences, especially for the surrounding area. You can see this unusual leak along the Cascadia subduction zone, which is a massive fault line off the Pacific Northwest coast. It's a place where two pretty big plates that make up Earth's crust come together and slide along each other. The water from Pythia's oasis kind of acts as a lubricant between these plates. You can think of the fault zone as an air hockey table. When the fluid pressure is high, it's like you've turned the air on. That means the friction between the plates is reduced, which allows the plates to move. But if the fluid pressure is lower, the two plates can lock together, which then leads to the buildup of stress. Not that they'll feel bad, in the context of tectonic plates, stress is some pressure or force that can cause deformation. And if this stress starts to build up, at some point, it's got to go somewhere. When it's too much, it can trigger earthquakes and most likely not small ones. For example, a release of stress in the Cascadia subduction zone could lead to a magnitude 9 earthquake. For comparison, the biggest earthquake we've ever recorded happened in Chile in 1960 and it had a magnitude of 9.5. The damage was enormous. So we hope the water will stay in its reservoir and keep maintaining the delicate balance between the tectonic plates. 
We've explored only 5% of the ocean. Who knows how many cool things are there at the bottom, waiting to be found? For example, check out these mysterious holes scientists have stumbled upon in the depths of the Atlantic Ocean, near the Azores. They're neatly aligned and are about 4 inches apart, or in some cases, even several feet. They resemble punctures left by a sewing machine. Some think these holes could have a biological origin. For instance, some fish may have made them while walking along the seafloor. Others believe we could be looking at something that's human-made, maybe left by a spiked tire. Of course, such holes are perfect for making up stories about creatures from other planets who allegedly made them. Or maybe even legendary monsters, like that one from Loch Ness. It's definitely hard to explain such symmetry of the holes, but one deep-sea biologist offered a pretty good explanation. He said there could be an animal burrowing beneath the sediment, and from time to time, it could make little chimneys just to get access to clean water circulation in its small burrow. I mean, there are sediment piles around the opening of each hole, and they do support the idea that something pushed the soil from below. But there's still no proof these holes are actually connected beneath the surface. And there are also a lot of things hidden at the bottom of the oceans and seas that ancient civilizations left us. For instance, archaeologists made a really cool discovery off the southern coast of Croatia, a road hidden under layers of sea mud that's 7,000 years old. They found the ancient road at the sunken Neolithic site of Solin. The site of Solin was a human-made island in ancient times, and an archaeologist discovered it two years ago. He was studying satellite images of the area around Korčula, one of the beautiful Croatian islands. When he realized there could be something interesting at the bottom of the sea, he dove into the water with his colleague. And under the surface of the Adriatic Sea, which is part of the Mediterranean Sea, at a depth of 13 to 16 feet, they found stone walls that were most likely part of some ancient settlement. The landmass where people built the settlement was separated from the main island by a narrow stretch of land. Luckily, this area is protected from big waves by the surrounding islands, so the site remained relatively well preserved. It's now hidden beneath the surface of the sea and covered in mud. But it's so exciting to imagine how people walked on that road nearly 7,000 years ago, visiting nearby settlements. If you want to see the weirdest creatures, you can always head to the bottom of the sea. Actually, scientists have determined there could be more than 30 potentially new species at the bottom of the Pacific Ocean. They've collected them using their remote-controlled vehicle. That's a big step because until recently, they could only study such creatures through photographs. I'm talking about segmented worms, different types of coral, some invertebrates similar to centipedes, and many others. But there are also many old freaky creatures that we already know about that look like they came from sci-fi movies. Red octopus, blobfish, okay this one kind of looks normal until you raise it to the surface, the goblin shark, Sloan's viper fish, zombie worms, ugh, yeah I hear ya, let's move on. The seafloor hides things from space too. There are traces of rare forms of plutonium and iron at the bottom of the Pacific Ocean. And what's awesome is that all this has come from space. These radioactive materials probably formed during some kind of cataclysmic event in space and eventually made their way out to our beautiful home planet. And this extraterrestrial debris most likely appeared on Earth within the past 10 million years. After it fell to the Pacific Ocean and settled at a depth of almost a mile, it became part of all those layers of rock down there. Plutonium is especially exciting for scientists. I mean, only tiny amounts of it have been found. Hundreds of atoms, maybe. But it's still remarkable because these atoms are created by exploding stars. Things like this can help us better understand how the universe produces elements heavier than iron, like plutonium, gold, uranium, and platinum. We're still not sure about the origins of these elements. For a long time, scientists believed that supernovae, which is when a star comes to its end in a fabulous explosion, were responsible for creating these heavy elements. But it seems it's not just that. Some other cosmic events, such as the collision of neutron stars, which are super-dense collapsed stars, 
or some rare types of supernovae could also be involved. Whoa, let me get my popcorn. Hundreds of diplomatic spaceships take off from Earth and head into space. When they reach their destination, they're met by hundreds of alien ships. This is humanity's first contact with an extraterrestrial civilization. People managed to detect them not so long ago, in a star system very close to our home. It's Proxima Centauri. This red dwarf star is the closest to our solar system. It's seven times smaller than our sun, which makes it only 50% bigger than Jupiter. Proxima Centauri is also eight times as light as the sun. This star system is 4.2 light years away. That's how long it takes a photon of light to travel from this star to Earth. By comparison, it only takes eight minutes for sunlight to reach our planet. If you decided to travel to Proxima Centauri, it would take you about 73,000 years to fly there in a conventional rocket. That's longer than our intelligent civilization has even existed. But it's not the star itself that interests us, it's the planet orbiting it. That's Proxima Centauri b. It's 17% bigger than Earth and about 10% heavier. It orbits its star at a distance of 4.5 million miles. By comparison, Earth is 93 million miles away from the Sun. That's 20 times farther. But the host star, Proxima Centauri, is a red dwarf. It doesn't emit as much light and heat as our Sun. So the planet Proxima Centauri b is right in the habitable zone of the star. It's located at such a perfect distance from its mother star that the planet neither gets too hot nor turns into a block of ice. In other words, the temperature there makes it possible for water to exist in its liquid state. This means that Proxima Centauri b could host life. But further observations of the planet make it doubtful. The host star is very unstable. Its brightness changes too frequently. In 2017, astronomers witnessed a catastrophic flash. The star increased its brightness by 1,000 times for 10 seconds. Before that, there was another weaker flash. The planet received an enormous amount of radiation. If there had been life there, that flare would have wiped it out completely. Overall, Proxima Centauri b receives about 400 times more X-rays than Earth. Complex living organisms cannot live under such conditions. Scientists say that even if there was an atmosphere and an ocean on Proxima Centauri b, this constant radiation would simply blow them off the planet. Proxima Centauri b is so close to its host star that it's gravitationally locked to it. This means that the planet is always turned to the star with only one side, just like the moon is turned toward Earth. That means that only one side of the planet receives this awful amount of radiation. And some experts speculate that an intelligent civilization might live on the night side of the planet. And it could be this civilization that sent us the strange signal that astronomers caught in 2019. Scientists described it as, quote, a bright long duration optical flare accompanied by a series of intense coherent radio bursts. This radio signal was observed for 30 days by one of the radio telescopes on Earth. Scientists thought the signal was artificial and could have been sent by an extraterrestrial civilization. Presumably, the signal came from Proxima Centauri b, or one of the moons that might be in that star system. But further observations failed to detect the signal. Now, the main theory claims that this radio signal is just some kind of interference from some technology on Earth. But what if it was really sent by a civilization living on the dark side of Proxima Centauri b? Well, we may soon find out for sure. People are launching a brand new telescope into space. It's the James Webb Space Telescope. It's scheduled to be launched at the end of 2021. A booster rocket will take off from Earth and reach orbit. Then, it'll deliver the telescope to a specific point between our planet and the Sun, where their gravitational forces are roughly equal. Plus, there's no light pollution in space, unlike on Earth's surface. There are also no clouds or other weather conditions that might interfere with the telescope. The James Webb Space Telescope will replace the Hubble Telescope, which has been operating in space since 1990. The new telescope costs $9.8 billion. And here's why. It'll use a mirror as wide as a boxing ring. This will allow the telescope to see very far into space. So far, in fact, that the light from some events happening there won't have reached Earth yet. This means we will literally be able to look back in time. The James Webb Space Telescope will see the universe almost immediately after the Big Bang. 
we'll see how the first stars and galaxies were born, and how the universe turned into what we observe today. But also, this telescope can be used to examine Proxima Centauri b. Astronomers will be looking for artificial light there, like the LED lights we have on Earth. If Proxima Centauri b really hosts life on its night side, then the locals must have learned to transfer heat and light from the day side of the planet, and they would have to use artificial light to support life on their side. The James Webb Space Telescope is powerful enough to distinguish the light waves emitted by the star from those that might be created by someone on the dark side of the planet. And if we do detect some artificial light, we'll have the first ever confirmation that an intelligent civilization might exist outside our solar system. But there's always room for error in calculations and data interpretation. The only way to establish the truth once and for all is to send a space probe to Proxima Centauri. Then we can get real pictures of the planet. The main problem is distance. Although Proxima Centauri is the closest to the Earth star system, it still takes tens of thousands of years to get there. After all, the Voyager 1 space probe needed about 44 years just to leave the solar system. And that's just a small step compared to the actual distance to the nearest star. So we need other methods of travel, and they have to be much faster. Some scientists want to send microprobes to Proxima Centauri b. They won't be any heavier than a sewing needle. A launch vehicle will deploy about a thousand of these probes into orbit. Then they will unfold a space sail. This is an ultralight material that will use the power of light to create thrust. When the sail is deployed, we'll focus a powerful laser beam onto it. This will accelerate the probes to about 20% of the speed of light. This will be an absolute speed record by our standards, but it'll still take about 21 years for these probes to reach their destination. And we'll have to wait for about four more years just to get the first signal from them. The Proxima Centauri star system isn't the only potential world to host life. And one of the tasks of the James Webb Space Telescope is to look out for other worlds. The telescope's powerful instruments will allow it to find relatively cold planets where temperatures are close to those on Earth. We'll be able to study in detail around two dozen nearby star systems, and we'll be able to detect not only planets themselves, but also their moons. Scientists expect a boom in the discovery of exoplanets. From the start of the telescope in 2022, we'll constantly be detecting new worlds and learning more about those already discovered. The James Webb Space Telescope will allow us to better study our own solar system, Jupiter's moon Europa, for example. Scientists believe there might be water there. Although Europa looks like a block of ice, the moon's gravitational interaction with Jupiter heats its core. That likely makes the ice deep below the surface melt. So there's likely to be an ocean under the ice crust. Similar conditions could exist on Enceladus, Saturn's moon. This moon is geologically active. There are geysers that burst out of the cracks on the moon's surface. The James Webb Space Telescope's infrared instruments will be able to explore Europa and Enceladus in search of biosignatures. Those are the traces of life activity of living organisms or bacteria. This telescope is scheduled to operate for about six years. But in the future, we'll launch an even bigger one. It's called Louvoir, which stands for the Large UV Optical Infrared Surveyor. Its mirror will be twice the size of that of the James Webb Space Telescope and almost seven times the size of the Hubble's. The telescope is scheduled to be launched in 2039. We'll get it into orbit with the help of a super heavy rocket. Then we'll have to deliver the telescope to its destination, one million miles away from Earth. And then it'll begin its observations. We could learn to travel faster than the speed of light by that time. Then, if we find a potentially habitable planet with the help of the telescope, we can send a space probe or even a team of explorers there. In this case, a diplomatic meeting with an extraterrestrial civilization might become a reality. The concept of oil on troubled waters may seem like a strange expression, but its meaning of calming a tense situation is well understood. The origins of this phrase, though, have a much more literal explanation. It's true that even the roughest waves can be subdued by simple oil. Just like you dress your salad with oil to make it nicer, you can dress the sea to make it calmer. At the end of the 19th century, captains from various ships shared their experiences of using oil to calm rough waves in letters to the New York Times. 
One of those captains, Olsen of the Norwegian bark Wilhelmine, detailed what he did to save his crew and ship during violent storms. Despite the challenges they faced, the oil trick proved to be a game changer, drawing up the weather side of the deck and helping them navigate through heavy gales. His words hinted at a secret power hidden within these simple bags made of sailcloth filled with irregular animal oil. He used it several times, and each time, the technique worked like a charm. One time, his crew encountered heavy gales on their voyage to Belfast. They were causing quite a stir, but they managed to stay ahead of the game by deploying these bags made of sailcloth filled with animal oil. As soon as they released the bag from the cat head, the weather side of the deck dried up in no time, even as the seas continued to wash over it. It was pretty neat to see it working its magic without even needing to check if the bag was empty, as it was a real lifesaver. Their vessel was still a little shaky and taking on water on the lee side, but this little trick really helped them out. Captain Jenkins from the British steamer Francisco used a similar method to calm the seas during their voyage from Hull, England to Boston. They ran into some strong westerly gales, causing really big waves. They didn't want to head any further north, so they decided to stop the engines and chill for a bit. They stuffed some oakum into the pipes of the closets and filled them with oil, and it worked like magic. The sea calmed down along the side of the ship, the big waves disappeared, and they stayed nice and dry. In total, 12 masters shared their success stories of using oil against rough waves, with only one reporting that it didn't work as expected. The use of storm oil, as sailors called it, was a tried and true method of preserving crew, cargo, and livestock from the harsh sea conditions. The toughest thing some of them experienced was just a little spray. Their methods were a tad different, but all of them used oil. But what made this storm oil so effective? First off, let's clarify something. Storm oil is not your average supermarket olive oil. To be truly effective, storm oil must be made of that thick, next-to-water insoluble consistency. Technically, it acts like a surfactant. This practice is very old and has been used for many centuries. Since ancient times, people have poured oil to calm ocean waves. It was poured onto the ocean surface to reduce wave intensity, making it easier for sea rescuers and navigation. This spilled oil accumulates on the surface and creates a concentration gradient that leads to extra dissipation and damping as waves move. In the past, steamships and lifeboats from various countries were required to carry storm oil as this practice continued until the late 20th century. It was included in the United States Maritime Service Training Manual as essential equipment for lifeboats, and British vessels were mandated to have it until 1998. Often, vegetable oil or fish oil was used as a cost-effective option. While those options were commonly used as storm oil substitutes, the thick consistency was the key to the oil's effectiveness. Storm oil has a dampening effect on water, absorbing some energy from the waves. It quickly forms a thin layer over a large area of the water surface, preventing wind from creating waves easily. The use of oil to calm ocean waves dates back to ancient times, with Aristotle and Pliny the Elder discussing its effects. Benjamin Franklin famously studied the calming properties of oil on waves during his trips to England in the 18th century. Communication between Franklin, William Brownrigg, and Sir John Pringle led to further exploration of this phenomenon. Agnes Pockles also made significant contributions to the study of storm oils through her experiments in Germany. She suggested that the calming effect of oil on water involved more than just reducing surface tension. Oil is definitely a game changer when it comes to calming rough seas. But it's not just any oil that does the trick. You gotta use the right kind of oil and apply it the right way. Forget engine oil and other petroleum products, they won't do much. Fish oils are where it's at, especially the thick ones. The problem is, modern ships and boats don't really carry fish oils, so folks end up using engine oils and bunker oils instead. Not surprising that they don't see the calming effects they were hoping for. Back in the day, the Coast Guard used to carry a little tank of oil for rescue missions in choppy waters, but they stopped that practice ages ago. You can't just pour the oil on the water. 
you gotta let it leak out gradually, drop by drop. The best way is to hang a bag of cod liver oil or something like that over the side of the boat. The oil seeps out through the bag onto the water surface and smooths out the waves. Not only does the oil calm things down, but it also stops the wind from messing with the surface. Just a bit of the right oil, like a gallon or so, can flatten out a huge area around the boat. Believe it or not, tossing oil into the sea used to be allowed. Steamships and lifeboats were actually required to have equipment to slowly release oil during storms. The lifeboats on the Titanic fell under British law from 1894, which said they had to carry oil for bad weather. Now for the science part, as oil decreases water's surface tension, preventing those pesky waves from breaking. It's like adding an invisible layer over the water that makes it super smooth. So when you pour some oil into water, the molecules don't clump up as they spread out to form a super thin layer. These oil molecules kind of do a somersault, standing on their heads and aligning with the water molecules like magnets. This creates a film on the water surface that is just one molecule thick. You can actually figure out the size of a single oil molecule by trying this out. For instance, one tester used a spoon that was under half an inch high, and the oil spot it spread out on the water was massive. If you do the math, you'll see that one molecule is incredibly tiny. Usually, wind creates waves by moving the surface of the water, but a layer of oil molecules acts as a barrier, stopping the wind from making waves and just pushing the oil around instead. This pretty cool trick has been used by all sorts of people throughout history for different reasons. I've already mentioned that Benjamin Franklin studied this phenomenon a lot, but he also liked to prank people by using this science. He would claim he could calm a choppy lake with just the touch of his cane. Turns out, he had a little vial of oil in the bottom of his cane that he could tap out onto the water surface. It made him look like some sort of magician or water-bending master. By the way, the science behind this trick is still used today. By putting a thin film of oil or smaller molecules like magnesium fluoride on glass, you can create invisible glass that reduces glare and reflection. This type of glass is used in smartphones, tablets, laptops, and glasses. 